Chapter 3 The Crisis of Marxism In 1928, the left opposition was hopelessly fragmented by sectarian splintering, and it clearly failed to establish a living alternative to the communist and social democratic parties. Korsh began working with independent leftist trade unions and gave lectures on economics, labor law, and Marxism. Since the parties had failed to materially advance the liberation of the working class, Korsh focused his energies on the activities of revolutionary unions and their struggles. The results of over a decade of class struggle in Europe and the Soviet Union were, he bitterly concluded, an even greater enslavement of the workers, progress in domination. Moreover, the Stalinization process in the Soviet Union and advent of fascism in Europe indicated the possibility of even greater suffering for workers in the future. The failure of the focal working class organization forced Korsh to seek both new revolutionary possibilities and the reasons for the shipwreck of the working class advance which had seemed to put socialist revolution on the historical agenda. Korsh's tragedy was that he grasped the reasons for the failure of the working class movement anticipated the triumph of fascism and counter-revolution, but could envisage no forces, groups, or strategies which could withstand the counter-revolutionary offensive. This state of affairs forced Korsh to put Marxism and his own theoretical position into radical question. Let us reflect here a moment on the strange political theoretical odyssey of Karl Korsh. He traversed the full spectrum of German left parties, moving from the SPD and Fabian Socialism to the Independent Socialist Party, the USPD, after the war, and then to the KPD in 1920. Further, Korsh was one of the first to be expelled from the KPD and the Communist International and became one of the leading figures of the left opposition in 1926. Korsh, better than any Western Marxist, reflects the waves of revolution and counter-revolution that inundated Europe in the 1920s. Korsh's theorizing was rooted in the tumultuous class struggles of the Weimar Republic, and he developed an, and modified his theory in relation to the ever-changing historical situation. The Praxis philosopher Korsh was above all concerned to obtain a unity of theory and practice, that is, to derive his theory from the requirements and possibilities of the historical situation, and then to translate theory into action, to make theory a material force in, in revolutionary struggle. I have argued that Korsh's revolutionary historicism posited revolutionary theory as an expression of existing class struggle and conceived of both ideology and revolutionary theory as realities that played an important part in social life and historical change. In this context, one could see Korsh's own theoretical practice as embodying this dialectic that derives theory from the existing social reality and in turn aims at a unity of theory and practice. Korsh's expulsion from the Communist Party and the subsequent splintering of the left opposition into powerless small groups rendered problematical the unity of Korsh's theory with existing practice and put into question Korsh's theoretical position. Korsh seemed to think that authentic revolutionary theory had to be a reality, that is, embodied in an existing political movement. Mere theory that floats above the historical situation, criticizing everything and changing nothing, projecting bountiful possibilities and realizing none of those possibilities was for Korsh self-defeating negativism and idealist speculation. Korsh's hard-headed sense of the real and his fanatic attempt to ground his theory in existing practice is admirable and corrects some of the excesses of hypercritical negative dialectics whose negations posit no alternatives as well as a utopian socialism whose alternatives hover above and outside of reality and the possible. But it seems clear that Korsh, the political theorist of praxis, practice, goes too far in rejecting the autonomy of theory and minimizing the anticipatory components of theory. For Korsh's theory fails to transcend the political vicissitudes of the moment and fails to create an autonomous theory rooted in a global conception of history, society, and human liberation. Moreover, the anticipatory normative components of theory are sacrificed when theory is merely derived from existing practice. The early course, in fact, brilliantly formulated the future-oriented quality of revolutionary Marxism in a passage we have already cited. Korsh, the communist political activist, on the, one on the other hand, 
course, the communist political activists, on the other hand, seem to have neglected these anticipatory qualities that posited a better future based on a theory of liberation and socialism that could guide political practice, and from which standpoint one could judge whether one's practice was emancipatory and hence authentically revolutionary. Further, the defeat of the revolutionary communist forces meant for Korsh the shipwreck of his revolutionary historicism, which identified Leninist theory with revolutionary reality. Reflections on Korsh's abortive Leninism should reveal the limits of his revolutionary historicism that grounds revolutionary theory in what one takes to be the actual revolutionary struggles. During periods of intense revolutionary struggle, it appears that a theory such as Leninism, which is a historical actor and material force in the actual revolutionary struggles, represents the reality of revolution. In this context, it appears that the theory is an expression of the actual historical movement, the theoretical consciousness of the struggles themselves. But although there appears to be a unity slash identity between revolutionary theory and practice in times of revolutionary struggle, what happens to the theory when a period of revolutionary upsurge grinds to a halt or is defeated by a counter-revolutionary thrust? Moreover, nah, yeah? Alright. No. Okay. Alright. All right, thank you. Have fun. Moreover, if theory is merely the expression of revolutionary struggle, from what standpoint could one criticize Stalinism or fascism in a counter-revolutionary era when the forces of revolution are temporarily defeated and dormant? Further, Korsh's too hasty identification of Leninism and so the Soviet Union with revolutionary reality as the embodiment of revolutionary Marxism raises the question, from what standpoint can one identify a struggle, a class, a situation as revolutionary? Surely one's theory of revolution helps determine what really is revolutionary and what sort of practice one should thus defend or attack, participate in, or struggle against. Course questioned the assumptions that the assumptions that Marxism or Leninism were intrinsically revolutionary, and that whatever events coincide with the pattern of Marxian theory are in fact the revolution. Such an identification of Marxism-Leninism with revolution per se would imply that anything that does not fit in with the revolutionary scenario is not revolutionary. Korsh began to discern that the identification of Marxism-Leninism with revolutionary reality was a species of mysticism that found its temple and delegitimization in Stalin's trials and death camps. Korsh's Revolutionary historicism was bumped up against its own limits and forced him to put both Marxism and his theory in question. The result of his reflections from the late 1920s through the 1940s led to, I believe, a modification of both his interpretation of Marxism and his own position vis-a-vis -vis Marxism, the triumph of the counter-revolution in the Soviet Union and ascendancy of fascism on a worldwide scale, created a crisis of Marxism which Korsh was to analyze in detail. The Critique of Orthodox Marxism Korsh began a new period of inquiry into the crisis of Marxism carried out in various discussion groups and lecture series in Berlin in the late 1920s. He published a critique of social democratic theory and practice as expressed in the recent work of Karl Kautsky in 1929. Korsh showed how the purported differences between Bernstein's revisionism and Kautsky's quote orthodoxy were nugatory. Although Ka Kautsky claimed his theory is, quote, pure science, end quote, Korsh interpreted it as the, quote, ideological expression of a determinate historical movement, end quote. More precisely, Kautskyism is, quote, the ideology of German social democracy, which in its latest phase presents the transition from a concealed to an open revisionism, end quote. Korsh carries through a brilliant demonstration of Kautsky's falsification of Marx that at once suppressed the revolutionary content of Marxism and, quote, cryptically veiled, end quote, Kautsky's own, quote, hidden revisionist content, end quote. Kors shows how Kautsky's theory of history borrows much from the Marxian concept, but at crucial points departs from and distorts the Marxian theory. Through an analysis of Kautsky's notion of, quote, dialectic and development, end quote, nature and society, and the state, class and class struggle, and the, quote, historical significance of Kautskyism.
Korsh argues that Kautsky completely suppresses the revolutionary components of Marxism by reifying Marx's historical materialism into an objective set of categories and laws that passively reflects historical developments, excluding activist praxis-oriented revolutionary features of Marxism. He shows further how Kautsky continually falls behind the level of Marxian theory to earlier bourgeois theories and ideas. Korsh concludes that Kautskyism has become a fetter on today's working class, which limits its struggles to the, quote, ideals and goals of the once revolutionary bourgeoisie, end quote, that sacrifices the revolutionary content of Marxism. In a 1930 edition to a new edition of Marxism and Philosophy, Korsh includes Lenin and Soviet Marxism in the current, quote, Current, Marx, current Marxist, quote, orthodoxy, which in Korsh's view falsifies revolutionary Marxism. Korsh marvels that social democratic and communist critics both denounced Marxism and philosophy on identical grounds. Both maintained a dogmatic, scientistic, positivistic conception of Marxism that suppressed its dialectical, historically specific, and critical components. Both maintained a, quote, materialist outlook that is colored by the natural sciences, end quote, which in effect reflects the dominant bourgeois attitude of scientific positivism. Thus, in Korsh's view, Lenin and his followers never abandoned the, quote, spiritual legacy, end quote, of the Marxism of the Second International, quote, in spite of some things they said in the heat of battle, end quote. The problem, Korsh believed, was that the Marxist orthodoxies really never adopted the whole of the Marxian theory. Rather, all they adopted were, quote, some isolated economic, political, and social theories extracted from the general content of revolutionary Marxism, end quote. This altered the meaning of Marxism and truncated and falsified its content. The conclusion of Korsh's research into the failure of Marxism to provide a satisfactory theory and practice of revolution are a major theme of his later work. The passing of Marxian orthodoxy provides a swan song to the hopes of an earlier epoch of revolutionary struggle. Korsh suggests that Bernstein's revisionism, reformism, alone expressed the reality of the working class movement which was engaged in reformist practice. In Korsh's view, the revolutionary rhetoric of the, quote, orthodox Marxist was a mere, quote, ideological dissemblance, end quote, which had nothing to do with the practice and reality of the working class movement. Moreover, even the, quote, left, Marxists, Lenin, and Marxists, Lenin and Luxembourg failed to penetrate to the core of the problem and focused on Bernstein's theory, whose power to seduce and mislead the workers they saw as the problem. Luxembourg, course suggests, was guilty of a, quote, ideological bedazzlement, end quote, in claiming that, quote, Bernstein's theory was the first and at the same time the last attempt to give a theoretical base to opportunism, end quote, within a supposedly still revolutionary social democratic movement. As it turns out, Luxembourg was historically refuted in arguing against Bernstein, who claimed that the movement was everything and the final goal nothing, that the, quote, final goal was everything, end quote, for it, quote, revealed itself in subsequent actual history as, in fact, that nothing which Bernstein, the sober observer of reality, had already termed it, end quote. Hence, Luxembourg failed to see that the problem was not Bernstein's theory, but reformist practice, which Bernstein merely, quote, merely honestly and accurately expressed. Lenin, too, Korsh argued, although, quote, subjectively a deadly enemy of the, quote, renegade Bernstein, end quote, tacitly and silently conceded Bernstein's main point about the reformism of the working class movement by rooting the, quote, revolutionary character, end quote, of the labor movement, not in actual class struggles or the movement itself, but rather, quote, only in the leadership of this struggle by way of the revolutionary party guided by a correct Marxist theory, end quote. Korsh intensifies his critique of Lenin, end quote, in the in his essay, The History of the Marxist Ideology in Russia, where he suggests that Lenin transformed Marxism into, quote, an ideological form assumed by the materialist struggle, excuse me, Korsh identifies his critique of Lenin in the history of the Marxist ideology in Russia, where he suggests that Lenin transformed Marxism into an ideological form assumed by the material struggle for putting across the capitalist development in a pre-capitalist country, end quote. 
ironically Korsh is suggesting that Marxism played the same role in Russia as bourgeois ideology in Europe by serving to accelerate capitalist development. Whereas the populist Narodnik ideology stressed that capitalism was impossible in Russia, Lenin from the beginning represented the Marxist viewpoint that Russia must proceed through the stages of industrialization and capitalism to be able to ultimately construct a socialist society. Course showed how Marx, Engels, and Lenin all were willing to adopt their theory to the conditions in, in Russia, and how, from the beginning, Marxism served as a, quote, ideological cloak for a development which in its actual tendency is capitalistic, end quote. Hence, in Korsh's view, Marxism in Russia was but a, quote, revolutionary myth, end quote, which ideologically proclaimed that what was in fact capitalist development was revolutionary socialist development. Both Stalin and Trotsky and official Soviet Marxists followed the, quote, new Marxist myth, of the inherently socialist character of the Soviet state and of the thereby basically guaranteed possibility of a complete realization of socialist society in an isolated Soviet Russia, end quote. Kors sadly concludes, quote, this degeneration of the Marxian doctrine to a mere ideological justification of what in its actual tendency is a capitalist state and thus inevitably a state based on the suppression of the progressive revolutionary movement of the proletarian class, closes the first phase of the history of the Marxist ideology in Russia, end quote. Hence, Korsh believed that both Soviet Marxism and social democratic revisionism had become ideologies that legitimated a reformist practice which in fact strengthened the capitalist system. Both were thus divorced from the reality of those genuinely revolutionary forces and struggles which sought the overthrow of capitalism and construction of socialism. Marxism had become an ideology vitiated by a split between theory and revolutionary practice which, all, which both legitimated reformist practice and served as an instrument of domination, in, particularly, in particular the Soviet Union. In particularly the Soviet Union. Whereas earlier Korsh had blamed the failure of the working class movement on its neglect slash suppression of the revolutionary core of Marxism and urged a restoration of revolutionary Marxism, he now began to assess the extent to which Marxism itself was responsible for the debacle of the working class movement. Quote, <laughs> It is, it is deceptive and even false to see the theoretical origins of the present crisis as resulting either from a perversion or an oversimplification of Marx and Engels' revolutionary theory at the hands of their successors. It is equally misleading to juxtapose this degeneration, degenerated falsified Marxism to the, quote, pure theory of Marx and Engels themselves. In the last analysis, today's crisis is the crisis of Marx and Engels' theory as well, end quote. The crisis of Marxism, of course, re reveals, both, reveals, reveals itself both as a collapse of the dominant position Marxism held in the revolutionary movement and in the transformation of Marxian theory and practice into a state orthodoxy and reformist practice. Th Marxism is a product of an earlier era of class struggle and, quote, consequently lacks any real relation to contemporary class struggles emerging as a result of wholly new conditions, end quote. Marx and Engels had carried out a full-scale critique of, quote, all aspects of the existing class society, economic base and superstructure from the newly acquired perspective of the proletariat, end quote, and conceptualized both the, quote, real developmental laws of the existing capitalist society and hence, at the same time, the real conditions of revolutionary class actions, end quote. But the current Marxist orthodoxy had, quote, developed into a purely abstract and passive theory dealing with the objective course of social development as determined by external laws, end quote. Korsh was objecting to both a theoretical stagnation of Marxist theory, which had failed to keep up with the vicissitudes of capitalist development, and to the reification of Marxism into a set of objectivistic laws that supposedly describe the objective course of capitalist development and crisis-slash-collapse. These laws were formulated in a system of, quote, scientific socialism, end quote, that allowed its adepts to predict the course of economic political development. This scientization of Marxism fell prey, Korsh believed, to a, quote, 
objectivistic fetishism, end quote, that reified economic laws into a deterministic system and which excluded elements of class struggle and the, quote, subjective action of the working class, end quote. Korsh took up this theme in an essay, quote, on some fundamental presuppositions for a materialist discussion of crisis theory, end quote. He criticized, quote, objectivistic, end quote, theories of capitalist crises, crisis, which postulated the inevitable fall of capitalism according to laws of, quote, iron logic, end quote. Such a theory is based upon, quote, insufficient deduction, end quote, and is therefore pseudoscientific. Further, it is also... It also is not the best sort of theory for producing revolutionary consciousness and action, since it induces fatalism and a passive waiting for the collapse. It can also contribute to mystifying the workers by their learned, quote, theoreticians, end quote, who supposedly hold the key to historical development. Equally dubious from a scientific and political point of view are those theories of capitalist stability maintained by Bernstein, Hilferding, and the like, which claim that capitalism is now crisis-free and can overcome any temporary dislocations. This thesis flies in the face of a series of acute crises, Korsh believed, and reduces socialism to a moral demand for reformist or ref um, This thesis flies in the face of a series of acute crises, Korsh believed, and reduced socialism to a moral demand for reformist practice. Hence, the Marxist crisis theory resembles a, quote, revolutionary myth, end quote, in Sorel's words, Sorel's words, in Sorel's sense, Jesus Christ. Hence, the Marxist theory resembles a, quote, revolutionary myth, end quote, in Sorel's sense. No really scientific prediction can be made as to the avoidability or inevitability of capitalist crises. This does not mean, however, as Sorel seemed to believe, that revolutionary theory solely consists of myths that move the workers to action. Quote, the materialist stance, end quote, Korsh wrote, quote, believes that certain, if only always very limited, prognostic statements sufficient for practical action can be made on the basis of always more exact and thorough empirical investigations of the present capitalist mode of production and its recognizable imminent tendencies of development. The materialist, therefore, investigates thoroughly the given situation of capitalist production, including the contradictions found therein, among which are also the situation, the level of consciousness, the degree of organization, and the readiness for struggle of the working class and all the various levels of the working class in order to determine its action, end quote. Korsh appraised various Marxian theories by their consequences for political action as well as their general validity. From both a theoretical and practical point of view, he dissected and put in radical question the leading Marxian theories. He concluded that none of the current trends in Marxism stood as an adequate theoretical expression for the continued practical needs of the proletarian class struggle. In fact, in the past decades, he argued, quote, the most important living theory of proletarian class struggle came from three different directions, each of which consciously and unconsciously stood opposed to orthodox Marxist theory. These three were unionist reformism, revolutionary syndicalism, and Leninist Bolshevism, end quote. Each of these tendencies is rooted in living class struggles and sought, quote, to make the subjective action of the working class rather than the objective development of capitalism the main focus of socialist theory, end quote. Korsh begins here his attempt to break the hegemony of Marxism over revolutionary struggles and to assess alternative theories, strategies, and movements which might aid the struggles of the working class in their liberation from capitalism. In the search for new revolutionary theories, possibilities, and openings, Korsh applied a critical historical materialist method to analyze the significance of the Paris Commune, the Russian Soviets, the German Council System, revolutionary syndicalism and anarchism, the workers' collectives in Spain, and struggles in the, quote, marginal areas of the international capitalist system, end quote, or what is today called the Third World. Course also called for a reevaluation of the theories of the utopian of quote the utopian socialists from Thomas More to the present day end quote and of such rivals of Marx as Blanqui and even his quote sworn enemies end quote such as Proudhon and Bakunin. The 
assessment of the significance of alternative theories and practice of revolution to Marxism would require putting elements of the Marxian theory in radical question. The remainder of my essay will discuss, one, Korsh's critique of the Marxian theory of revolution, two, Korsh's search for new possibilities for revolution, three, Korsh's analysis of new obstacles to revolution in the emerging worldwide counter-revolution, and four, Korsh's appraisal of what is living and dead in Marxism. Critique of the Marxian Theory of Revolution Two articles in the Paris Commune translated in this anthology enabled course to assess the importance of the Paris Commune in the context of an emerging critique of the Marxian theory of revolution. Korsh applied here his historical materialist method and criticized the leading Marxist lavish praise of the Commune as the model of revolutionary practice and the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, by interpreting the significance of the commune in the context of the history of class struggle in Europe, the Paris Commune for course, presented a task of, quote, revolutionary self-criticism, end quote, and a demystification of the Marxian interpretation of the commune. Course showed that there is a contradiction in Marx's appraisal of the commune where he at once esteemed the commune as the, quote, finally discovered political form for the liberation of the proletariat, end quote, and then claimed that the commune is, the va is valuable because of its openness, its indeterminateness, and its potential for further development. For course, this contradiction disclosed a deeper contradiction at the heart of the Marxian political theory. For on one hand, Marx enthusiastically affirmed the commune, which was a decentralized people's government on the Proudhonian federalist model, and yet Marx himself was an admirer of centralized state power. This, according to Korsh, revealed a contradiction in Marx's attitude towards the state, which at once is to be a, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, and is supposed to, quote, wither away, end quote. In fact, Korsh believed that serious problems resulted from the Marxian failure to resolve the antinomy between a decentralized, federalized, decentralized federalist political model and the highly centralized dictatorship of the proletariat model. Korsh himself was becoming increasingly critical of the Marxian political theory and theory of the state, which were full, he believed, of unresolved problems. He was becoming increasingly distrustful of the Marxian notion of the centralized state and was becoming more sympathetic to decentralized slash federalist concepts. He thought the Marxian theory of the, quote, two stages from socialism to communism provided a legitimation to, be, to indefinitely postpone the construction of the higher stage of socialism. Fucking birds are knocking things out of the trees. He believed this problem was evident in the actual development of the Soviet Union where Stalin justified his counter-revolutionary politics by claiming that the Soviet Union was but in the first stage of transition and that realizing the more radical demands of socialism must be postponed to the future. Korsh also began to believe that the Marxian theory of revolution was tied to its own historical circumstances of development and was infected with a Blancist Jacobin, infected with Blancist Jacobin features. That is, Marx formulated his political theory in response to his study and experience of the French Revolution and class struggles in France. He remained highly impressed with the Jacobin dictatorship, a strong centralized state used as the instrument of revolution, and the Blancist strategy of winning state power through the insurrection of a revolutionary elite. 
But the French Revolution was, after all, a bourgeois revolution, Coarse reasoned in his relentless logic, and perhaps Marx's understanding of revolution was too closely connected to the historical development of the bourgeoisie, which might be inappropriate for today's working class struggles under changed historical conditions. As Coarse put it in his, in his Theses on Hegel and Revolution, quote, the theory of proletarian revolution was not developed as such from its own foundation, but on the contrary arose from the bourgeois revolution, and thus in every relation to content and method is still tainted with the birthmarks of Jacobinism, that is, the bourgeois theory of revolution, end quote. In Korsh's Marx's position on the European Revolution of 1848, he suggests that, quote, Marx was, has remained dominated by the traditional conception, end quote, of revolution produced out of the French Revolution. In this article, Kors shows <laughs> that the demands Marx put forth in his activities during the German Revolution in 1848 to 49 did not overstep those of the, quote, democratic revolution, <laughs> end quote, and concludes, quote, Marx rejects positing a future socialist utopia against the reality of the bourgeois revolution, but he continuously sought to force upon the new revolutionary movement of his time past actions which were hardly connected with the forms of its present conditions. He sought to lift the democratic revolution of his time to a higher level and failed to see that this, quote, higher level in reality is but a historical level that was already once reached by the total revolutionary movement of a past epoch, i.e. the bourgeois revolution, end quote. Further, Korsh argued in Marx and the present tasks of the proletarian class struggle, end quote, that there is something odd about the, quote, the ideological character of his, this wholesale identification of an established doctrine with the revolutionary struggle of the working class, end quote. That is, he found it peculiar that the doctrines of the 19th century bourgeois theorists such as Marx and Engels should be taken as the authentic expression and guide for contemporary proletarian class struggles, and he expected to continue to lead the way in the future. Here Korsh broke with his earlier identification of Marxism and Leninism with the revolutionary movement. He now noted, quote, the identity of a bourgeois-bred doctrine with all present and future true revolutionary struggles of the proletarian class assumed the character of a veritable miracle, end quote. He believed that the identification of Marxism with both the course of capitalist development and proletarian class struggle took on a quasi-mystical character and in effect denied both that capitalism might well develop or collapse in quite different ways than Marx envisaged or envisioned. Further, the working class might develop a quite different strategy and goals for their liberation. <laughs> Hence, Kors rejected the, quote, pre-established harmony between the Marxist doctrine and the actual proletarian movement itself, end quote. One second. Where am I? Hence, Korsh rejected the, quote, pre-established harmony between the Marxist doctrine and the actual proletarian movement itself, end quote, and urged looking at existing class struggles and the historical situation anew to discern possibilities for liberation and working class advancement. Moreover, Korsh discerned an exaggeration of the importance of politics and the state in both Marx and Lenin. The political thrust of much of Korsh's later work was to emphasize the importance of trade union struggles and the social and economic dimensions for the liberation of the working class. He, saw, he, thought, that a Marxist, he thought that a Marxian theory of revolution, which urged seizing state power and smashing the bourgeois state, as the primary revolutionary task exaggerated the fundamentality of the political dimension and underestimated the importance of economic and social struggles. The, quote, true secret of the revolutionary commune, end quote, Korsh argued, quote, lies precisely in its social content, end quote, in the fact that the workers themselves took control of their everyday life in all its facets and not in discovering some universally valid, quote, political form, end quote.
Indeed, the political form of the commune, Korsh slyly and irreverently pointed out, is bourgeois to the core and has its origins in the Middle Ages and early municipal political forms which the bourgeoisie developed even before its centralized state as a weapon against the former feudal ruling classes. The proletariat can learn important lessons from the Paris Commune and might be able to use some of the Paris Commune's features in constructing a future society, Korsh believed, but it is a mistake to make a fetish of the Commune and hold it up as the model for all revolutionary struggles now and forevermore. Korsh's conclusion to his study of the Paris Commune contains an implicit critique of the Marxian concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat and instead urges as a Marxist concept this, of the state the earlier notion of a free association. Hell yeah, boy! <laughs> Go ahead. Quote, the authentic end goal of proletarian class struggle is not some more democratic more communal, or even more Soviet-like state, but the classless and stateless communist society whose encompassing form is no longer political force, but that, quote, association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all, end quote. It's a reference to the Communist Manifesto. Um. New Forms of Revolutionary Struggle in Spain Korsh's attempt to at once discern new possibilities and models of revolution and to criticize a too narrow Marxist concept of revolution was given decisive impetus by the Spanish Civil War, which, which was creating new forms of revolutionary struggle and new models of socioeconomic organization in the Spanish collectives. Korsh hoped that Spain would provide possibilities for the development of a truly revolutionary movement that would be independent of the hegemony of the Soviet Union and Communist Party and would thus avoid the pitfalls of Stalinism. In 1931, Korsh visited Spain as a guest of the Spanish syndicalists, the CNT, in their Congress at Madrid. Korsh wrote a sober and realistic account of the realistic account of the Spanish Revolution published in 1931, as well as two later reports on Spain, Economics and Politics in Revolutionary Spain and Collectivization in Spain, the first two of which are collected in this volume. In an unpublished draft, The Prehistory of the Spanish Revolution, Korsh showed how different waves of revolution and reaction in Spain in the last half century paralleled European development. He pointed out that, quote, the main tendency in the workers' movement in Spain was decisively anti-statist, anarchist, and syndicalist, end quote. The Social Democratic Party in Spain, on the other hand, showed even before its European counterparts the reformist, quote, state preservative position, which would characterize European social democrats. Look at these fucking mats flying in my face, dude. Fucking counter-revolutionaries. <laughs> In the, quote, Spanish Revolution, in the essay, The Spanish Revolution, Korsh carefully analyzed the situation that led the king to flee from Spain and open the door to potential revolutionary change. Korsh discussed the different leftist forces struggling for power and the tasks, problems, and obstacles they faced. He was especially sympathetic to the attempt of the revolutionary syndicalist CNT to throw off the yoke of oppression and to, quote, build a truly free and autonomous worker's life, end quote. He favorably discussed the detailed program set forth at the June 1931 Congress in Madrid, which he visited, and he indicated the political and economic problems remaining to be solved. He also analyzed the dangers of counter-revolution posed by the old reactionary powers, which were in fact later to fuse together in a fascist crucible and overthrow the revolution. In Economics and Politics in Revolutionary Spain, written seven years later when Korsh was in exile in America, he summed up the achievements and lessons to be learned from the experiences in Spain. Korsh was especially interested in the fact that the state power collapsed almost completely, enabling the workers to construct their own form of socio-economic self-government in the Spanish collectives. The achievements of the Spanish collectives show that the workers could do in every showed what the work what the workers could do in every industry and realm of life to reorganize their activity when they had the power to control their own lives and working conditions. The collectivization of industry took place on a regional and local level in both small and large-scale industries and revealed the power of the people to administer and govern their own life. 
The failure to maintain the collectives against the counter-revolutionary powers resulted at least in part, Korsh believed, from the, quote, traditional attitude of non-concernedness in all matters political and not strictly economic and social, end quote, of the Spanish syndicalists and anarchists. Hence, in Korsh's view, the lesson to be learned from the ultimate failure of the revolution in Spain was, quote, the vital connection between the economic and political action in every phase of the proletarian class struggle, end quote. Here it might be noted that Korsh never subscribed to the anarchist position on the unimportance of the state in political struggles. Although Korsh mistrusted Marxian overemphasis, overemphasis on the state and politics, he believed that the anarchists are just as one-sided in their neglect of the problem of the state and politics. Korsh himself urged a position that saw the vital importance of all economic, political, and social struggles for liberation and the overthrow of capitalism. Moreover, Korsh warned against judging the events in Spain or anywhere else from the standpoint of some ideal theory of revolution and then condemning a group or situation for failing to follow the model of the theory, as some Marxists were criticizing the Spanish for failing to follow the example of the Bolsheviks, although one can, Korsh concluded, learn important lessons from revolutionary struggles of the past, one should be aware of the historical uniqueness of the specific conditions and not impose an abstract theory of revolution on conditions to which it may not be appropriate. This is a political consequence of Korsh's principle of historic specificity, historical specificity. Korsh was concerned to break the hegemony of Marxism on revolutionary theory and to observe how specific revolutionary conditions produce a variety of forms of struggle and theory. Korsh concretized his study of Spain further in an essay, Collectivization in Spain, in which he discussed an anthology dealing with the details of the actual workers' struggles and that, quote, the Spanish revolutionary and let, oh, oh shit, that L looked like a, I don't know, a quotation mark or a, not a quotation mark, a, not a parenthesis, but the one that's got harder lines. <laughs> It's a more angular. Korsh concretized his study of Spain further in an essay, Collectivization in Spain, in which he discussed an anthology dealing with the details of the actual worker struggles that let, quote, the Spanish revolutionaries speak for themselves, end quote, as to provide, quote, the real content of the present struggles in revolutionary Spain, end quote. The experiment with the collectivization of industry and agriculture provided, Korsh believed, a, quote, new type of transition from capitalist to communist methods of production that has been achieved, though incompletely, in an imposing variety of forms, end quote. Korsh indicated some examples of the, quote, new type of community production, end quote, and, quote, new life of libertarian communism, end quote. The success achieved by the Spanish workers at reorganizing their life and work despite incredible obstacles testified to the initiative, endurance, and capacity for action in a working class unfettered by bourgeois domination. Especially praised is, quote, the emerging of the anti-state attitude of the revolutionary Spanish proletariat, unhampered by self-created organizational or ideological obstacles, end quote. The collectivization process was extended to not only capitalist firms and large farms, but also took place in municipal and state organizations, encompassing even barber shops and prostitution. This far-ranging process of socialization eloquently testifies to, quote, the peculiar creative power of the revolution, end quote, that was attempting to transform all realms of everyday life. Franco and his fascist cohorts, supported by the minions of Hitler and Mussolini, were to end this inspiring experiment in libertarian self-management socialism, but the final defeat and liquidation did not, in Korsh's view, obliterate its importance as an example of working-class struggle. Korsh was not in the least blind, however, to the menacing danger the working class faced from the monstrous expansion of fascism and counter-revolution on a worldwide scale. We recall that early in the 1920s, Korsh focused on the fascist phenomenon in Germany and continued to analyze the struggle against the growth of fascism in the 1930s. The result is his theory of counter-revolution. Korsh analyzes the counter-revolution. In 1931-32, as part of his educational work in Berlin, Korsh formulated 
quote, theses towards a critique of the fascist concept of the state. Fascism was not, in his view, primarily a regression to a pre-bourgeois type of state, but was rather a, quote, modern state form that was a negation of the liberal concept of state. Although the fascists maintained a, quote, completely irrational state mythology, quote, end quote, the fascists, quote, carried out through the, quote, elite, a sober, illusion-free, rational, goal-directed state praxis, end quote. Korsh took the orthodox Marxian position that the fascist state arose from the foundation of monopoly capitalism and exercised a monopoly of state power that represented the interest of monopoly capital, and that the fascist state took the explicit form of a class state exercised by the bourgeoisie. Hence, as opposed to Bolshevism, fascism attempted to preserve the previous relations of production and failed to, quote, unleash new forces of production, end quote. Finally, the tendency for the fascist state was towards totalitarian control of the entirety of society, and fascism threatened to spread throughout the capitalist world and to become an international counter-revolutionary menace. Indeed, this is exactly what happened. Hitler's National Socialism triumphed in Germany and forced Korsh and other radicals to emigrate. Korsh went underground and attempted to organize resistance. After the Reichstag fire gave the Nazis an excuse to exterminate the left, resistance was hopeless, however, and Korsh was forced to emigrate to England and later America. Korsh continued to analyze the fascist phenomenon and concluded after the triumph of fascism in Italy and Germany, after Franco's victory in Spain, and in light of the Stalinist crimes in the Soviet Union, that the counter-revolution had triumphed on a worldwide scale. The dimension of the counter-revolution, the threat it posed to the working class, and possible actions to be taken against it were analyzed in State and Counter-Revolution, the Fascist Counter-Revolution, and the Workers' Fight Against Fascism, all of which are published in this anthology. In State and Counter-Revolution, Korsh begins by exclaiming, more than any preceding period of recent history, and, a much va and on a mass much vaster scale, our period is a time not of revolution, but of counter-revolution. End quote. The counter-revolution prevailed, Korsh claimed, as a conscious attempt both to destroy an actual revolutionary process and to prevent a further revolutionary process from taking place. The counter-revolution represented a decisive defeat for the working class and the politics of European and Soviet leaders, aimed at, quote, the creation of conditions which will make impossible any independent movement of the European working class for a long time, end quote. Korsh analyzed the new role of the state in creating a, quote, fascist state capitalism, end quote, that more consciously than ever before uses the state as an instrument of suppression. Further, quote, the imperialist war and its aftermath have greatly accelerated and intensified both the transformation of monopoly capitalism into state monopoly capitalism and the monstrous oppression of the laboring masses by the state, which becomes increasingly intertwined with the all-powerful capitalist combines, end quote. In this context, Korsh believed that it is imperative to develop a theory of the counter-revolutionary role of the state and to discover ways to combat it. Quote, The Russian and non-Russian workers today cannot confine themselves to experiencing the steadily advancing counter-revolution without making every effort to interpret its significance. By a careful examination of the past, they must find out both the objective and subjective causes for the victory of fascist state capitalism. They must closely watch its unfolding in order to discover the old and new forms of contradiction and antagonism appearing in that development. Finally, they must find out a practical way to resist, as a class, the further encroachments of the counter-revolution and later to pass from an act of resistance to an even more active counter-offensive in order to overthrow both the particular state capitalist form recently adopted and the general principle of exploitation inherent in all old and new forms of bourgeois society and its state power, end quote. The Soviet Union was included in Korsh's concept of the counter-revolution, and he wished to call attention to the counter-revolutionary nature of the Soviet state. Korsh indicated the need to analyze the process through which a, quote, revolutionary dictatorship, end quote, has become a, quote, counter-revolutionary state, end quote, and even a, quote, powerful lever in the fascist, fascization, fascization of Europe, end quote. The problem is rooted, he suggests, in an ambiguity in political theory of Marxism and a failure to cut, quote, the umbilical cord between Marxism and Jacobinism. Fucking amen to that. We know, we noted the contradiction, 
between the Marxian emphasis on a strong centralized state and a decentralized people's government, and between the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, concept, and the notion of the, quote, withering away of the state, end quote. Marxism was too bound up, course believed, with the Jacobin notion of a revolutionary dictatorship using a strong centralized state as an instrument of, quote, permanent revolution, end quote. The problem is that the state can be used as a new instrument of domination that accrues ever more power and authority and refuses to, quote, wither away, end quote. This happened in the Soviet Union through a, quote, general degeneration, end quote, in which the state, quote, abandoned more and more of its original proletarian features, end quote, and became, quote, an instrument of the present-day European counter-revolution, end quote. Course never unambiguously offers a solution to the problem of the state, but his analysis suggests a critique of the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the overemphasis of the role of the state in the revolutionary process in the Marxian theory. Course criticizes those Marxists who applaud the triumph of fascism as preparing the way for the later advent of socialism, and as though, such as those in the KPD who advance the slogan, quote, after Hitler, us, end quote. The problem he suggests in the, quote, fascist counter-revolution, or in the, his essay, The Fascist Counter-Revolution, is a lack of an adequate Marxian conception of counter-revolution. Marx shows how Marx, Proudhon, LaSalle, and the socialist Democrats all greeted various manifestations of counter-revolution as in some way creating conditions for a later so victory of socialism. He argues that the disaster position maintained by the communists that fascism was but a step on the way to socialism is rooted in the Marxian failure to understand counter-revolution. Most Marxist course claims see counter-revolution as a quote abnormal interruption of a normally progressive development. Hence they are caught up in 19th century bourgeois concepts of progress and an amelioration and an amelioristic evolutionary view of history. Moreover, the Marxist under attack fail to see how fascism is part of the evolutionary growth of capitalism itself. Course conceives fascism as an attempt to solve the tasks which the reformist parties and the trade unions, unionists, the trade unions promised to achieve but were unable to carry out. After the, quote, complete exhaustion and defeat of the revolutionary forces, end quote, fascism attempts to solve the labor problem, the problem of planning the economy, and the problem of capitalist crisis in a counter-revolutionary manner that preserves the old relations of production. Korsh argues, quote, from this viewpoint, all those comfortable illusions about a hidden revolutionary significance in the temporary victory of the counter-revolution in which the earlier Marxists so frequently indulge, must be entirely abandoned, end quote. In view of the worldwide triumph of the counter-revolution and lack of any perceptible revolutionary alternative, Korsh was very pessimistic about the possibility of defeating fascism or even beginning a decisive working-class offensive. He was especially skeptical of the strategy of, de of gathering all the so-called democratic forces to defeat fascism. Quote, Least of all can fascism be defeated by those people who, after a hundred years of shameless acquiescence in the total abandonment of their original ideals, now hasten to conjure up the infancy of the capitalist age with its belief in liberty, equality, fraternity, and free trade, while at the same time they surreptitiously and inefficiently try to imitate, as far as possible, fascism's abolition of the last remnants of those early capitalist ideas." End quote. In an article, The Workers' Fight Against Fascism, Korsh analyzed the, quote, crisis of democracy, end quote, and its tendency to either collapse in the face of a fascist offensive or to re be ready to adopt fascist methods in its own economy, society, and foreign politics. In the fight up for Britain, the fight for democracy, and the war aims of the working class, Korsh doubted the sincerity of the desire of the British who had appeased Hitler and for a century had been the bulwark of imperialism to re represent democracy in the interests of the working class. Korsh rejected here the United Front strategy pushed by both the Comintern and the Social Democrats. Instead, Korsh urged the workers not to swallow whole the democratic slogans of the bourgeoisie, but to attempt to advance their own class aims and demands and to beware of tendencies towards fascization from within and without fascization from within and without. This does not mean capitulation to fascism. Quote, this criticism of the inept 
and sentimental methods of present-day anti-fascism does not imply by any means that the workers should do openly what the bourgeoisie does under the disguise of a so-called anti-fascist fight, acquiesce in the face of fascism. The point is to fight fascism not by fascist means, but on its own ground." End quote. Fighting fascism on its own ground presumably means fighting for control of production, fighting for control of the state, and fighting against monopoly capital in its, all its forms. The old class contradictions have emerged more brutally than before, Korsh believes, and the workers' primary responsibility is to fight their major enemy, the capitalist ruling class. Quote, what then is the hope left for the anti-fascists who are opposing the present European war and who will oppose the coming war of the hemispheres? The answer is that, just as life itself does not stop at the entrance of war, neither does the material work of modern industrial production. Fascists today quite correctly conceive the whole of their economy, that substitute for a genuine socialist economy in terms of a, quote, war economy, end quote. Thus it is the task of the workers and the soldiers to see to it that this job is no longer done within the restrictive rules imposed upon human labor in present-day capitalist, monopolist, and oppressive society. It has to be done in the manner prescribed by the particular instruments used, that is, the manner prescribed by the productive forces available at the present stage of industrial development. In this manner, both the productive and the destructive forces of present-day society, as every worker, every soldier knows, can be used only if they are used against their present monopolistic rulers. Total mobilization of the productive forces presupposes total mo mobilization of that greatest productive force, which is the revolutionary working class itself." End quote. Exactly what strategy Kors had in mind here is unclear, and in view of the powerful hegemony of fascism and monopoly capitalism, he despaired of any real possibility of eliminating them. In the workers' fight against fascism, Kors analyzed the economic pythia that workers in America faced in the highly concentrated and seemingly invulnerable power of, mo of corporate capitalism. Basing his analysis on Burla and Means, the modern corporation and private property, and the 1939 government report, The Structure of the American Economy, Kors outlined the incredible concentration of corporate capital and power in America. The state of affairs represents the end, the quote, end of the market, end quote, and the development of a system of corporate and state capitalism where monopoly is the, quote, general condition of present-day economy, end quote. Kors argued, quote, more than at any previous time, the monopoly of political power reveals itself as the power to rule and control the social forces of production. At the same time, this means, under present conditions, the power to restrict production, both the production of industry and peace, and the destructive production in wartime, and to regulate it in the interest of the, monopolistic, the monopolist class." End quote. In Korsh's view, this new development of corporate capitalism is similar in many ways to fascism itself. Quote, there is very little difference between that economic, quote, coordination that is achieved and sometimes not achieved by the political decrees of victorious Nazism, fascism, and Bolshevism, and this new, quote, corporate community that has been created by a slow but relentless process in this country through the system of, quote, interlocking directorates through the activities of the major financing institutions, through particular interest groups, through firms rendering legal accounting and similar services to the larger corporations, through, quote, intercorporate stockholdings and a number of other devices. And, quote, there is no essential difference between the way the New York Times and the Nazi press publish daily, quote, all the news that's fit to print, end quote, under existing conditions of privilege and coercion and hypocrisy. There is no difference in principle between the 80-odd voices of capitalist mammoth corporations which over the American radio recommend to legions of silent listeners the use of x lax camels, and neighborhood groceries, along with music, war, bas baseball, domestic news, and dramatic sketches, and the one suave voice of Mr. Goebbels who recommends armaments, race purity, and the worship of the Fuhrer. He too is quite willing to let them have music along with it, plenty of music, sporting news, and all the unpolitical stuff they can take, end quote. 
Korsh's evaluation of the totalitarian domination by capital and the corporate state in advanced industrial society was amazingly similar in some respects to the analyses of the Frankfurt School. These theories were developed in the 1930s and 1940s under the dual impact of the defeat of the working class movement in the triumph of fascism and exposure as emigres to the new conditions of life in the emerging late capitalist society in the United States. Korkheimer, Adorno, Marcuse, and Korsh were overwhelmed by fascism and the United States in quite similar ways. The experience of a European emigre whose hopes for socialist revolution were shattered on the twin reefs of fascism and corporate capitalism were clearly and interestingly expressed in a revealing letter to Paul Partos, accompanied by a document on American science written at the end of July 1939. America, Korsh wrote, is, quote, truly different from Europe, certainly from the old Europe in which we all lived, worked, and engaged in our struggles, end quote. In Europe, one had a relatively clear conception of the state and society, the possibilities for social change, and how one could participate in the process. In Europe, quote, one could one stood within a movement with a well-known past that led from a familiar present to a sufficiently known future. One had a theory which one could relate to critically at will, exactly because one stood so firmly in that theory. In America, end quote. In America, however, quote, everything is too big, too wide, too incomprehensible, too dispersed to enable one to take a similar position, end quote. Moreover, quote, the isolated individual feels himself too small, too powerless, and too unknowing in view of the largeness, multiplicity, and changeability of the general existence and process, end quote. Both the individual and group found themselves in a, quote, indeterminate, end quote, situation confronted, from with, confronted with, quote, unlimited possibilities, end quote. Quote, in abstract infinity and freedom exists for everyone and for no one, end quote. Both the sciences and general conditions in America were subject to incredible change and the proliferation of novelty, making it impossible to get a firm grasp of things. Quote, the constant change of investigated facts, the uncovering of new regions, the discovery of new methods, the instant classification of all counter-tendencies, the neutralization of all abnormality and illegality, the instrumentalization of business, politics, corruption, violence, criminality, all this is so much taken for granted that the eruption of novelty in science signifies neither conflict nor tension, but only the daily fulfilling of the moving principle, whereby fundamentally it doesn't matter much whether the new is truly new, since in the in unceasing transition from what, is, from what is now familiar to, quote, something new, the old and every day will always be discovered again as new, end quote. The quote, change, end quote, itself is the principle of American science. In this situation of flux and seeming novelty, a critical theory seems to have lost its purpose and foundation. Course had intimations here of Marcuse's, quote, one-dimensionality, end quote, where all the classical contradictions of capitalism are established in an unholy harmony. In the process of constant change, Korsh writes, quote, despite all fluctuations on the surface, there is no dangerous crisis-like state, no conflict that isn't neutralized, no idea that is not at once ideologized and welcomed as a novelty by the dominant ideology, end quote. All this simultaneous change and stability, sameness, has, quote, the appearance of true progress, end quote. But it is really just monopoly capitalism reproducing itself, creating a confusing garden of earthly delights for consumption to provide, quote, prosperity everlasting, which means, in effect, higher profits and more efficient, and social, more efficient social control for the monopolists. Quote, a science that is institutionalized along with an institutionalized big capital produces in one and the same way a new form of social demand. In this way, monopoly capitalism reproduces here in its cornucopia, once again, the fortunate constellation from the early time of competitive capitalism. Quote, the sciences blossom, the arts prosper, it is a joy to live, end quote. As for politics in America, Korsh could discover no point of intersection for his left oppositionalist tendency. 
quote, one can only say and do here what is false, misunderstood, incomprehensible. If one does not wish to limit oneself to the Sisyphean task of struggling against the poisoning of the CP, the Communist Party, end quote. Struggling against American reformist, bureaucratized, and corrupt unions, as against the Communist Party, would only in any case serve the interests of the bourgeoisie against labor. Horkheimer was later to take a similar position. The various political groups merely engage in a confused, quote, tug of war against each other without the prospect of any decisive victory that will aid the working class. What could, what could one do in this situation, Korsh wondered. Yet Korsh made a continuous effort to analyze the economic political situation in America, contributed articles to the leading Marxist journals, gave lectures to workers and university people throughout his travels in the United States and maintained close contact with Paul Maddock and the group of council communists, but had little hope of any possibility of real radical change or efficacious political activism. Quote, what the relatively most active man of our tendency, Paul Maddock, does, end quote, Korsh wrote to Partos, quote, appears to me too isolated, too short term for me to get involved with it, end quote. For the last 20 years, Korsh noted, the, quote, unre unresolved task of the revolutionary, end quote, was to seek a way that would be more than a mere, quote, complement to the Communist Party. The, quote, single historically real contribution here is that of the Spanish anarchist, and you know better than anyone who sh how short-lived and painful even this historically best contribution to the solution to the general task came out, end quote. Korsh wrote to Partos, whom he described later to Brecht as the, quote, last night of the completed first revolutionary epoch of the European workers' movement, who happily turned home from Valencia in the last hour, end quote. The final result of 20 years of class struggle was, in Korsh's view, a string of defeats. Quote, the entire past workers' movement, in all its forms, has really only prepared internal capital internal capitalist progress that is presently introduced in counter-revolutionary form through fascism and on a world scale is executed and secured through all capitalist systems, end quote. Thus, although course continued to maintain that the working class had a, quote, potentially revolutionary significance, end quote, course conceded that, quote, phenomenally, end quote, it may well have a counter-revolutionary significance, another position that Marcuse was later to defend. This state of affairs forced Korsh to put the Marxist theory of revolution in radical question and produced the positions he would later formulate in 10 Theses on Marxism today. Korsh and Marxism Korsh deeply pondered the tragic experiences of the working class movement in Europe and continuously intended to write a study of social movements and social forces that would trace the itinerary of the revolutionary and counter-revolutionary movements from the French Revolution to the present day. In a letter to Brecht, he wrote, quote, I am planning to re-specialize myself from Marxism to sociology and to the logic of social sciences, two planned books, Social forces and social movements should be divided into a very abstract first part and an almost ideographical second part, dealing with revolution and counter-revolution, working time around two years at least. Two, social theory should be a textbook for academic use that will eventually land me a job, end quote. Of course, I wish to appraise the various radical and bourgeois social theories in light of the historical development of those movements which either embodied them or repulsed them. He became increasingly interested in the process of history from the rise of capitalism to the present day and wrote a series of historical monographs and reflections upon history itself and those historians who interpreted it. But above all, Korsh was obsessed with Marxism. What role had Marxism played in the defeat of the working class movement? What validity did Marxism have in the light of the triumph of fascism and, and counter-revolution? Why had the Marxian socialist revolution failed to take place in the dominant capitalist countries?
What in Mar the Marxian theory was a hindrance to the further development of a revolutionary movement? movement? What constructive role could Marxism still play in future revolutionary movements? Moreover, Korsh became increasingly concerned with the scientific theoretical status of Marxism. How could Marxism stand up to the results of recent empirical and methodological research in the sciences? How could the Marxian methodology itself be strengthened and made more rigorous with the aid of recent developments in scientific theory? Finally, what was the relation between the scientific and revolutionary political aspects of Marxian theory? Korsh was involved with the, those, these questions from the 1930s up until his debilitating fatal illness ended his late theoretical labors in the 1950s. In the 1930s, Korsh became increasingly interested in the theoretical status of Marxism. In a series of essays and lectures, he tested the Marxian theory against the results of the philosophy of science developed by the Vienna Circle and Philip Frank and Kurt Leuven, which he studied and worked, with whom he studied and worked. Korsh never adequately mediated his interest in the political revolutionary and theoretical scientific components of the Marxian theory. In the 1920s, Korsh maintained a mostly pragmatic attitude towards theory and judged a theory solely by its ability to success successfully guide practice, judging, for example, a theory like Leninism on its ability to carry through socialist revolution. But in the 1930s, Korsh became more interested in the formal aspects of theory and spent much time studying formal logic, the mathematical calculus, and the philosophy of science. Korsh never swallowed whole, however, the dogmas of positivism and maintained a critical attitude towards scientific empiricism, logical formalism, and other pet theories of the Vienna Circle. It is, in fact, my belief that Korsh studied philosophy of science and engaged in metatheoretical research, primarily in the interest of strengthening the theoretical status of Marxism, which he felt had been neglected in the inept hands of the leading social democratic and communist theoreticians. Korsh at different times held two quite contradictory interpretations of the theoretical status of Marxism and points of view from which it could be evaluated. Many times he argued that Marxism requires no philosophical or scientific grounding because Marxism is grounded in the working class forces and social struggles in historical reality. Moreover, Korsh often cited his friend Brecht's dictum that, quote, truth is concrete, end quote, that true theory is judged and evaluated according to its results in practice. But to apply this criterion is to testing Marxism. When the working class movement is defeated and its forces are exhausted or co-opted, what foundation does Marxism then have, and how can it be tested in practice? A possible solution which Korsh seemed to consider but never committed himself to would be to ground Marxism in the scientificity of its theory and evaluate it according to its truth as a description of socio-economic historical reality. Korsh, in fact, seemed to believe that Marxism was the true theory in this sense of history, society, and political economy, and that Marxism's truth did not solely rest in its embodiment in working class forces and practice, but also in the scientific strength and cogency of the theory itself. Although there is an unresolved tension in the later course between the insufficiently mediated political revolutionary and theoretical scientific components of the Marxian theory, it would be a mistake to believe that Korsh fell into the snares of either a totally pragmatized theory that solely judges theory on its political use, Korsh criticized Lenin on these grounds, or that he took a totally positivistic view of the theory. In fact, Korsh continued to defend a version of dialectical Marxism and never fell into the dogmas of pragmatism or positivism. Indeed, a serious problem for Korsh, which he never adequately resolved, was the relation between dialectics and science. Korsh continuously reflected on Hegel and dialectics and how they were appropriated trans slash transformed by Marx. Course tended to play down the conflicts between dialectics and science, finding much materialism and empiricism in Hegel, dialectics and science, and a successful synthesis in Marx. In a letter to Paul Maddock giving a critique of his concept of Marxism and dialectics, Korsh argued that dialectics for Marx is not a magic wand, but, quote, served Marx as a hand tool for seeking and finding his scientific results. He once learned this method and had no other. In a lesser degree, this is still so for us today, end quote. Korsh opposed assigning too grand a note to the concept of synthesis in Marx's dialectic, 
as if, as Maddock wrote, the communist society was the grand synthesis of Marx's production, and concluded that he is, quote, an opponent of philosophical absolute, end quote, interpretations of dialectics, because, quote, thereby the strict empirical scientific knowledge of the current factual situation that lies before us, and above all, praxis as, quote, human sensuous activity, end quote, is underplayed, end quote. Course was equally critical, however, of making a fetish of science, of contemporary science. He wrote, quote, after the abolition of fetishism, which adheres to science in the epoch of commodity production, science will truly be equivalent to accumulated human labor growing forces of production, end quote. Course suggested that science had fallen prey to fetishism, which could only be eliminated through, quote, eliminating classes and class contradictions, end quote. A, quote, practical historical task, end quote, and then, quote, science can be con reconstructed with material production on a higher level insofar as, quote, science is abolished, end quote. Course then indicated that he approved of the distinction between the natural sciences and the social sciences to the extent that that distinction elucidated the class character of the propositions of social sciences, but he also wished to stress that even the natural sciences have a class interest, quote, the same class character can be shown in the appropriate and rational way, in an appropriate and rational way within the natural sciences. End quote. Further, Korsh argues against the Engels-Lenin emphasis on the primacy of the man-nature relation as fundamental, which demotes the relation between socialized human beings to a secondary position, and renders the social sciences secondary to the natural sciences. Korsh counters, and I believe he is on the right track here. Quote. To me, it appears that nothing is primary here, that man-nature and man-man are to be coordinated, that both are equiprimordial and fundamental, historically, logically, and practically. The, quote, new element added on which the appearance, appearance of the first, uh, the, quote, new element added on with, added on with the appearance of the finished man namely society, end quote, in Engel's citation, is to me clearly an expression of a bourgeois conception of history and theory of revolution, end quote. Moreover, although Marxism, quote, formally recognized the genetic priority of nature, end quote, its, quote, primary interest, end quote, is in historical social development. Course then chides Maddock for wanting uncritically to, quote, allow the whole of science to stand as objective science, like the enchanted prince in the fairy tale. This all hangs together with what I characterize above all as the, quote, Engels-Lenin variant, end quote, of a tendency towards natural philosophy, end quote, i.e., he is criticizing the tendency championed by the positivist and positivistic Marxist to take the natural sciences as the model of truth. Moreover, in his discussion of the theoretical status of Marxism, Korsh constantly emphasizes that the propositions of Marxism undercut the rigid positivist distinction between fact and value, quantitative and qualitative propositions, description and critique. In a letter to Maddock, he reiterates a position he often took, quote, Marxism concerns itself with society primarily in dissolution. Thus, crisis is, quote, normal for Marxism, end quote, which doesn't exclude, he warns, careful empirical, which doesn't exclude, he warns, careful empirical quantitative analysis of the existing society. Above all, course endlessly claims Marxism is a theory of revolutionary practice. Hence, all of its propositions are geared toward critique and social change. Such a practically oriented theory is subject to continuous change and modification. Quote, I wanted to say, and have said, that it is a fallacy when one thinks that the militant character of revolutionary materialist theory, which is obviously to be preserved, can be protected by other means against a weakening of its fiber than through the complete readiness to accept all theoretically justified modification. The sole means towards preserving the militant, militant character consists in further developing science. I do not believe that at any time true revolutionary interests can come in conflict with real progress in science. Thus, to the contrary, all true progress is science. To, thus, to the contrary, all true progress in science is 
is welcome to revolutionary theory and practice, end quote. These issues raise the thorny question of the relationship between Marxian dialectics and science in Course's thought and the problem of Course and positivism. It is sometimes alleged that Course championed a positivistic version of Marxism and in his later work fell prey to the dogmas of positivism. Herbert Marcuse, for example, has written, quote, Brecht was strongly influenced by Korsch. Korsch's Marxism had a very strong positivistic content, and my friends in the Frankfurt School were against this positivistic content, end quote. Italian critics have claimed that Korsch collapsed the Marxian distinction between the empirical level and method of research and the conceptual level and method of presentation. It is claimed that Korsch collapsed I slash identified theory with the historical empirical level and thus deprived theory of one, its autonomy, two, its reflective critical capacity, and three, its anticipatory moment. Further, one could argue that Korsh operated with an instrumental concept of science and is not critical enough towards scientific methodology and practice, hence the argument that in the last analysis, Korsh fell prey to positivism. Although there is a case to be made for Korsh's kinship with some positivistic doctrines, one cannot simply label Korsh a positivist and end the matter without further discussion. I have tried to show that Korsh took a critical Marxist position on the sciences free from many of the positivist dogmas. Interestingly, in a letter to Partos, Korsh complained that Marx was not critical enough of the social sciences. Quote, as you know, in my orthodox period, I always claimed that the revolutionary kernel of Marx's economic theory was its, quote, critique, i.e. the essential critical solution of, quote, bourgeois political economy. In my last lessons of winter, 32 to 33, I have changed my viewpoint a little. I have shown how modest, if looked at very closely, is the critical contribution, as opposed to the book Capital's main economic content, how little developed were the critical points, and how a real critique, even of classical economy, was traceable only in the first volume of Capital, edited by, edited by Marx himself, while the manuscripts worked on and edited by Engels and Kautsky, second and third volumes of Capital, and the theories of surplus value, show Marx only as a critic of vulgar economics, and actually as a faithful disciple and follower of classical economics in the details of money, income, etc. There is a connection between the bourgeois character of Marx's politics and the would-be continuation of the critical dissolution of bourgeois economics into a science directly social and therefore into a praxis directly revolutionary. Marx certainly developed the historical critique of the economic category as well, and Sorel went too far when he challenged this, but he proclaimed the, quote, overcoming of economics into a directly social science only in the abstract instead of actually bringing it about, end quote, Korsh. This passage indicates that Korsh is criticizing Marx for being, quote, too positivistic, end quote, and uncritical towards bourgeois science, and for not going far enough in the direction of creating a new revolutionary social science that breaks completely, completely with previous bourgeois science. Korsh continually questioned the dogmas of orthodox Marxism and scientific positivism, and described his own theory as a, quote, non-dogmatic approach to Marxism, end quote. Crucially, Korsh never surrendered the Marxian dialectic of theory and practice. It made no sense for Korsh to discuss theory at all separated from social practice. Quote, in, or, or, in, a, do, in a non-dogmatic approach to Marxism, Korsh wrote, quote, there is no use in discussing controversial points in any social theory. Not even in that social theory which is commonly described as religion. Unless such discussion is part of an existing social struggle, the result of any such materialist discussion must in all cases, quote, make a difference, end quote, in respect to the actual behavior, not of an individual, nor, nor of a small group of people, but of a, of a veritable collectivity, a social mass, end quote. Against sterile, abstract discussions of Marxist dogmas, Korsh wrote, quote, it is here proposed to revindicate the critical 
pragmatic and activist element, which for all this has never been entirely eliminated from the social theory of Marx, and which during the few short phases of its predominance has made the theory a most efficient weapon of the proletarian class struggle, end quote. Korsh interestingly noted in a letter to Partos that he had earlier made, quote, the theoretical and practical position of Marx towards politics, the demarcation point of my division between what is living and dead in Marxism, end quote. The crux of the matter is that Korsh is above all a revolutionary theorist and is primarily interested in theory, science, and philosophy to the extent that they can serve an emancipatory role in the process of social change. Hence, although Korsh is in the last analysis often ambiguous as to where he stands vis-a-vis -vis Marxism and positivism, dialectics, and empirical science, one cannot simply label him a, quote, positivist Marxist, a la Marcuse or Adorno, without serious qualifications. Thus I reject those interpretations of Korsh, which either dismiss him as a, quote, positivist Marxist, end quote, or praise him for his purely, quote, scientific Marxism, end quote. On the other hand, I do not accept the interpretation of Korsh as a, quote, Hegelian Marxist, end quote, for from the beginning his appropriation of Hegel was highly critical and selective. In some of his works, for example, Hegel and Revolution, and in some letters, there are sharp, often violent attacks on Hegel. The fact of the matter is that Korsh neither was neither a positivist Marxist nor a Hegelian Marxist. Rather, he had a dialectical version of Marxism that was at once critical of orthodox Marxism, Hegel, and positivist science, while appropriating aspects of these theories in his own project. Korsh's major work of the 1930s, Karl Marx, is an attempt to mediate the contradictions between Marx and Hegel, dialectics and science, and the scientific and political revolutionary component of the Marxian theory. However, I believe it is a mistake to take Karl Marx, the book, as Korsh's definitive work, or as his, quote, masterpiece. Moreover, I believe that Buckmiller is wrong in claiming, quote, Korsh's struggle with Marxism expresses itself especially in this book, end quote. Rather, Korsh's critique of Marxism is better expressed in the series of essays collected in this anthology. Karl Marx, in this sense, is non-representative of Korsh's later work, for it suppresses Korsh's radical critique of Marxism. Karl Marx is, and was intended to be, a popularization of Marxism that would exposit and defend the Marxist teaching for a wide audience. As such, it is ex eminently successful and provides an excellent summary and overview of the Marxian teaching on society, political economy, and history, but it is in no way as critical of Marxism as many of Korsh's essays from the period. The truth of the Marxian theory is assumed and defended throughout, as is its superiority to all bourgeois theories. Throughout Karl Marx, there are laudatory passages like the following, quote, Marx's new socialist and proletarian science, which, in a changed historical situation, further developed the revolutionary theory of the class founders of the doctrine of society, is the genuine social science of our time, end quote. Or, Marxism, quote, was far and away in advance of the other contemporary schools of social thought. Marxism remains superior to all other social theories even now, in spite of the comparatively negligible progress which Marxists have in the meantime made in the formal development of the methods discovered by Marx and Engels. In a particularly philosophical form, it has yet achieved a great number of important scientific results which hold good to this day. End quote. Hence, although course, the course excerpt can sometimes read between the lines of Karl Marx, Quote, Korsh's struggle with Marxism, end quote, on the whole, one finds a sympathetic and systematic defense of the Marxian theory. For example, in Karl Marx, Korsh does not question the Marxian theory of revolution, which he so penetratingly challenges in so many, in, in many of his other works. None of the critiques that I discuss in the introductory material are developed in Karl Marx, and Korsh generally cites the major Marxist text as gospel. Even Lenin's essay, Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder, 
whose position's course usually attacked, is favorably sighted in Karl Marx. Its non-critical insertion here drove Paul Maddock to a sharp critique. It is true that course generally develops a critical dialectical version of Marxism in Karl Marx that is certainly superior to the social democratic and communist orthodoxies, but there is no critique of Marxism of the sort that distinguishes the most challenging and stimulating work of the later course. On the other hand, not only Karl Marx, but the overwhelming bulk of Korsh's later work refutes the judgment that Korsh abandoned Marxism. Although Korsh radically questioned aspects of the Marxian political theory and theory of revolution, Korsh never abandoned his commitment to the liberation of the working class and to the Marxian belief that the working class and its struggles are the motor and telos of our history and the vehicle of social change. Hence, Korsh never surrendered the Marxian position that the overthrow of capitalism and the construction of socialism is the main task on the historical agenda. Korsh's friend and student, Heinz Langerhans, is on the right track when he claims that, quote, the proletariat is the empirical foundation of Korsh's theory, end quote, and that, quote, Korsh never discussed, quote, Marxism through the omission of the authentic point of reference, the, quote, proletariat, and to be sure, proletariat as an active power, end quote. For Korsh, in Langerhans words, quote, the activity of the revolutionary proletariat as the empirical foundation of Marxism, end quote, remained the crucial pivot around which his own theory revolved. Korsh never abandoned a practical concern with the liberation of the working class and continuously stressed the role of revolutionary practice in social change. As Langerhans notes, quote, this activistic comp component is the decisive characteristic of Korsh's theoretical efforts and his position within the communist movement right up until his death. To the end of his life, Korsh championed a, quote, non-dogmatic Marxism, end quote, and the main source of his later despair was the belief that a defeated and enslaved working class could not realize the Marxian theory in a non-revolutionary era dominated by the counter-revolution. A new period of revolutionary struggles, however, would awaken interest in the Marxian theory and enable Marx to arise again as a politically relevant historical figure. This being... This began happening in the so-called Third World. A new period of revolutionary struggles, however, would awaken interest in the Marxian theory and enable Marxism to gain, to rise again as a politically relevant historical force. This began happening in the so-called Third World and the National Liberation Movements, and Korsh welcomed these movements as, prov as providing a possible rebirth of revolutionary theory and new possibilities for revolutionary practice. Indeed, Korsh had been keenly aware of this phenomenon since the 1920s, and his group, Communistische Politique, and later Maddox Group and Journal, published many articles on China and other revolutionary struggles in the Third World. In posing the question of whether Korsh abandoned Marxism, it is significant to note that the project he was working on in the mid-1950s when he contracted sclerosis was a manuscript called The Time of Abolitions, which attempted to take up a problematic that was central to the Marxist theory, but which had never been adequately developed. His wife Hader writes, quote, He thought that as capitalist society had developed since Marx's time, Marxism too should have developed to understand it. His uncompleted text the, quote, manuscript of abolitions, is an attempt to develop a Marxist theory of historical development in terms of the future abolition of the divisions that constitute our society, such as the divisions between different classes, between town and country, between mental and physical labor, end quote. Korsh thought Marxism through to the end and lived through a period of history that put Marxism in radical question. Korsh himself never reached a final verdict on the present status and future fate of Marxism, and the movement of history has not yet put us in a position to write the final obituary or elegy to Marxism. It is our lot, as it was Korsh's, to live through a period of revolution and counter-revolution where the outcome is uncertain and the role of Marxism in this scenario is vital but problematical. Bertolt Brecht, who studied with Korsh, well understood the predicament of his former teacher. Walter Benjamin reports, quote, Yesterday after playing chess, Brecht said, quote, You know, when Korsh comes, we really ought to work out a new game with him. 
a game in which the moves do not always stay the same, where the function of each piece changes after it has stood in the same square for a while, end quote. Course helps us to understand the changing moves of the game of revolution and counter-revolution in our time, but does not, no one does, give us the results, the strategy for winning, or the probable outcome. Korsh in Exile Korsh's years of exile in England, Denmark, and the United States are generally tragic and depressing. Forced to emigrate from Germany at Hitler's rise to power, Korsh went to England where he began work on Karl Marx. He found a generally cold reception there and was involved in the inevitable emigre politics and one sordid scandal. He found moments of refuge and stimulating conditions for work in his visits with Brecht, who was living in Denmark. In travels throughout Europe, before the outbreak of the Second World War, he attempted to maintain contact with leading left oppositionist figures and groups, but for the most part, Korsh was cut off from, the contact, from contact with the revolutionary movement with which he had been so deeply involved. In 1936, Korsh emigrated to America, where he was to remain for the rest of his life outside of brief trips to Europe and Mexico. In America, he was almost totally isolated from the revolutionary politics to which he had dedicated his life. Korsh was never able to find satisfactory employment in America and was never able to carry through any of the several major works which he outlined. He traveled widely, had contacts with many American intellectuals. European emigres and small working class groups it was never able to find any adequate institutional arrangements or political involvement. Korsh applied repeatedly for university appointments or financial support from American foundations, but was only able to receive infrequent visiting appointments on the assistant professor level at American universities, although he had been a full professor in Germany in the early 1920s. We have noted this general evaluation of his general evaluation of America and the lack of a revolutionary movement with which he could get involved. The main source of information on Korsh's exile period is his letters, which disclose his continuing interest in Marxist theory and practice. A letter to Paul Maddock translated in this anthology sheds light on the complex relation between Korsh and the Institute for Social Research. Korsh, we recall, was the teacher and friend of Felix Weil, who financed the Institute and purportedly wanted Korsh to head the institution. Korsh's students were active in the Institute while it was centered in Frankfurt, and Korsh frequently published in the Institute's journal. A growing strain evolved between Korsh and the Institute during the exile period, probably on account of Korsh's more orthodox and political version of Marxism. This tension is expressed in Korsh's pejorative evaluation of the Institute and its leading personalities in the letter to Matic. This tension explains why collaborative collaboration between Korsh and the Institute was unlikely to be productive, produce any positive results, and in fact, Korsh seemed to have very little productive contact with the Institute thereafter. Korsh did, however, remain in contact with Brecht, who provides an interesting picture of Korsh in America in his Arbeits journal. Caught Korsh again, who must leave the day after tomorrow. He has become heavier and speaks some, somewhat more in footnotes. He has really changed in personality. He was always strong, was, however, rather thin, and had these deep blue eyes beneath the dark brown. He is now industrious, robust, S eyes are smaller, almost cunning. He lives from the $100 of the Institute and works on his essays. That is unchanged, he says. He poeticizes his science while I make my poems like a shoemaker makes shoes. At the moment, he is interested in geopolitics, end quote. A remarkable letter from Korsh to Brecht fleshes out Korsh's 1940s perspectives. Korsh's expulsion from the world revolutionary movement seems to have elevated him to an increasingly Olympian perspective. This drive to grasp the dynamics of the totality of world history of the world historical totality is expressed in Korsh's report to Brecht on the present situation and perspectives. Korsh tells how he broke off his, ad his studies of the Philippines and the struggles between the new colonialism and national liberation movements to grasp the dynamics of, quote, a new era of regression on a worldwide scale, end quote. Korsh saw new tendencies of intellectual retrogression and new forms of imperialist barbarism that led him to a comparison with the decline of the Roman Empire. Striking is his desire to grasp the dynamics of the whole process of history from the, quote, century of Marx 
1848 to 1948 to the present day. Indicative of Course's historicism is his, is his desire to grasp the interconnections between theoretical, the theoretical dimensions of Marxism and its historical context, focusing on those, quote, practical challenges, end quote, which led to a disintegration as well as a development of the Marxian theory. Course indicates to Brecht how the Cold War and the emerging specter of Yankee imperialism has forced him to reevaluate his position on the Soviet Union. He concludes with some cryptic remarks on the emerging, quote, new world order, end quote. It appears from Korsh's letters that his moods changed from deeply pessimistic and depressive to relatively cheerful. He traveled around America a lot and continually sought contacts with political groups, maintaining a sharp interest in the political events in the day, of the day. In a 1948 letter to an Australian leftist journal included in this anthology, he indicated his willingness to contribute articles and notes, his plans to write a book that will, quote, trace both the final results of the, quote, Marxist era of the workers' movement to the original theory and practice of Marx. One, before, during, and after 1848. Two, during the period of the Working Man's International Association in the 1960s. He also indicated an interest in Bakunin and enclosed an article on the Paris Commune, which he says, quite, quote, might interest people who have not freed themselves from the Marx-Lenin-Trotsky legend to the same extent as you or I might claim it for ourselves, end quote. The last document in the anthology is a letter to er Eric Gerlach, with an additional note to Root Fisher. It shows both Korsh's attempt to make contact with the American working class movement and a desire to restore the, quote, ideas of Marx, end quote. Korsh, we see, never abandoned his interest in Marxism and was vitally concerned with the theory and practice of revolution right up until an attack of sclerosis ended his theoretical labors. Korsh spent his last years in McLean's psychiatric hospital and died in Belmont, Massachusetts on October 21st, 1961. Korsh was in a sense ahead of his time. His version of critical Marxism that challenged social democratic and communist orthodoxies and his search for new possibilities and forms of revolutionary change found an eager audience in the new left throughout the world in the 1960s. New course translations and anthologies have recently appeared in every major European language and there is a proliferation, proliferating amount of literature discussing and appraising Korsh's work. Korsh's course discussions in English-speaking countries have been hampered, however, by the inaccessibility of some of his most important texts which have been translated, which have not been translated, and are lie buried in obscure, now defunct journals. Moreover, there has been a general unfamiliarity with the Corsian opus as a whole and the historical circumstances within which his work was produced. The present introduction and anthology attempts to alleviate this condition and to provide the necessary prerequisites for a critical course reception in the English-speaking world, challenging us to discern, quote, what is living and dead, end quote, in both Marxism and Korsh. My introduction has traced the complex development of Korsh's life and work and has shown the need for a historical theoretical reconstruction of the Korshian work as well as the need for a critical reception that applies the same critical standards to Korsh that he applied to other thinkers, especially the Marxists. Korsh, is in an especially interesting way, was con connected with one of the most fateful political and intellectual dramas of our time, and his odyssey as a critical Marxist through the forlorn terrain of the working class movement helps us to come to terms with a crucial segment of modern history. Korsh's adventures with Marxism have produced a body of work that continues to challenge and stimulate our own critical thinking, and to this end, the anthology is dedicated.